So, welcome everybody. Um, thanks for coming. So today our speaker is Benham Ismaili from the University of Pittsburgh and um, I forgot the title. I'm sorry. What's the title? Benham? So let's write it up here. Co-area formula. But for maps into general metric spaces. All right, so that's the title. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. I want to thank the uh, organizers for the invitation and the chance to disseminate some, uh, some math. So I want to begin my talk by one of the theorems that we all love and admire, and that will be uh, Fubini's theorem, the workhorse of analysis. So what it says is that if I have to integrate a function over Rn plus n, function g that goes into real line, and it's integrable, then to integrate over Rn plus m my g against the Lebesgue measure, then I can instead do the following. I can uh, fix a hyperplane that is vertical. So I fix a point here and uh, in the space Rn. And then this becomes a, an m-dimensional hyperplane. I first uh, integrate over this copy here, which will be, so if this point is x, uh, sorry, if this point is z, then this will be z multiplied r n. So I'll position my hand uh, in future to avoid this. So here I want to integrate over z times r n, my function g, but this time it's restriction to the copy of r n, so I will use the big measure l n and this will depend on the value z. Then I play around with this z. I, I take the next z and then all of the followings on Rn. So I add all these values now in Rn against the big measure ln z. So I hope I got that one right for Fubini. So another way of integrating a function over R n, or I'd rather use rn plus 1. So let's again look at a function, this time from rn plus 1 into r. Again, you have an integrable function g. And this time, to integrate my function g on rn plus 1, dln plus 1, um, I look at the sphere of radius r. So um, you can imagine these as n-dimensional. So it would be a nicer picture if I had like um, a nested sequence of circles, but well, my drawing skills allow me to do this in two dimensions. So, um, so here I get the surface n-dimensional sphere of radius r. So this time I want to integrate over this surface, my g, and here I want to use the um, surface measure of the um, sphere, which I want to go ahead and denote by the Hausdorff dimension, Hausdorff measure, which anyway agrees with the spherical um, intrinsic measure, the, the manifold measure of, of that. So I integrate this uh, only along one of these spheres. And then, you know, what's next? Because now I have to fill out the whole space. So um, I have to play around with my R. So R ranges. I want to put R1 uh, with no fear. Um, assuming that if R is negative, I have the empty set and I get nothing. So these are two ways of integrating a function by first integrating over some, some uh, lower dimensional subsets. Now. Is there something common to these two formulas? Yes. 
Um, in this case, the spaces that I integrated over first, these ones, can be viewed as the level sets of the projection function. So I have f of x, y equal x, and uh, where x is in r n and y is in r m. So this space here is just the level set of the singleton z. And uh, I will drop this notation here and I will keep writing simply f inverse of z. Hopefully this won't confuse anyone with the inverse of the function. It, it has nothing to do with that. I will never look at inverse of the function. And uh, so this Fubini theorem is saying that you integrate over level sets of the function f, um, and then uh, you pick z from the image of f. So f is rn plus m into rn. OK, is the same true for the second formula? Let's see. So the spheres are level sets of what function? So f goes from rn plus 1, the domain where we wanted to integrate, into this time just r1, real line. And um, f of x is absolute value of x. And uh, so these are just pre-images, f inverses of, again, single point. So in this case, just r. So we can write both formulas in the unified notation that um, I have a function. So I have to integrate over Rn plus m, a function against the Lebesgue measure. I first integrate over the level sets of another function, the function g, OK? And then I integrate over the target space on dLn z. And here, the measure, the dimension that I use is m. Now, we'll get to that soon. Um, so the question is, Uh, for what other f is this true? Okay, any questions? Please feel free to interrupt at any time. So, um, just to be clear, we're looking for conditions on a function f from Rn plus M into Rn such that for any measurable G, L1 Rn plus M, we want to have such a formula to hold. And the answer is um, very satisfying. And that is called the co-area formula. So the naming comes from uh, this being a co-of the area formula. So for the surface area formula that one learns in calculus two, uh, the, the first example of that one learns in calculus two, gives you a way of computing the uh, some integral when you map from a smaller space into a larger space. So you have a curve in R3 or you have a surface in, inside R3 and you want to integrate. But now in these cases, you go from a bigger space down into smaller space. So it's reversed and the prefix for reversing things in math is co. Um, so what it says is the following. Uh, 
if we have, so it, it says that the only condition you want on F is that F is Lipschitz, and that's just impressive. So um, if F from Rn plus M into Rn is um, Lipschitz, Um, then for any G integrable on R n plus M. So integrable deep uh, questions here are not uh, the, the main point here. So we can always assume G is a continuous compactly supported function, um, which you can uh, actually approximate any L1 by such functions anyway. So then for any G in L1, um, the, the formula, the query formula holds. So here is Rn plus M. Uh, this time I have to write a name for the variable. So G of X, Jacobian uh, der derivative of F of X, DLN plus M X equals integral over Rn integral over level sets of f um, g against m dimensional measure and then d l n z so is the formula clear uh, well it shouldn't be because what is that jacobian that just appeared well um, you do need some kind of jacobian right even in, in the case you go from r n to r n uh, you don't just have integral equal integral. You, you need to bring in the, the um, some correcting factor, the so-called Jacobian. So in, in, if you have equal dimensions, J Jacobian is just the uh, determinant of the matrix. But here, um, the n-dimensional Jacobian of f. So uh, f is from Rn plus m into Rn. So its derivative will be a linear map again from Rn plus M into Rn. So it's not a square matrix to um, take its determinant. So what we do, we multiply it by its transpose. And then, um, so, um, and then we take determinant of, of that. So sorry for the mistake there. So determinant of that multiplication, and then you take square root of x. And that is Jacobian of d of f x, the n-dimensional Jacobian. So um, that formula holds. So that's the query of theorem, finally, the period. Um, I will discuss later what the uh, geometric interpretation of this n-dimensional Jacobian is. So, so far, um, I don't have any metric space in the general sense. So this is, we will, uh, when I say Euclidean query formula, I will mean this one. Um, before moving on, there are some very, very legitimate questions uh, when, when you um, present this formula to someone who isn't necessarily familiar with geometric measure theory. The first question is, um, wait, what is derivative, right? So what is derivative of f of x? Because um, f is only assumed to be Lipschitz. And uh, that the answer to that is the, well, quite famous uh, Rademacher theorem, uh, which says that if f is a function between any Euclidean spaces, uh, not necessarily one dimension being bigger than the other one, is Lipschitz, then at almost every, in the Lebesgue measure sense, at Lebesgue almost every x in Rk, f is differentiable. Uh, sorry. Okay. Uh, that answers that question. So almost everywhere, the derivative 
is, is well defined. So this de determinant and the Jacobian is well defined and you want to integrate. So you only care uh, about uh, functions up to a null set. So what is the other question? Well, uh, probably you should ask me the other questions. The other one is, um, remember we integrate G first over F inverse of Z, right? You, you, want, you want to look at the level set, which is just um, the set of all X's such that F of X equals Z. And if your Z is only Lipschitz, then this set can be crazy, right? Um, how crazy can these pre-images be? Uh, and, and can I really integrate over them? Um, well, here, um, if you are, if you have been exposed to smooth category only, um, one answer, one uh, answer in the positive direction is the Sard theorem that says in the smooth category, say infinity category, that um, for almost every Z, F inverse of Z is, uh, so it, these Z's are exactly the regular values of F, so it is um, an M-dimensional manifold. Um, so, and again, integration in the target was also, uh, so you only care about almost every Z, and for almost every Z, this is not actually a too bad set. It's, it's a manifold if you, your F happens to be smooth, and then you can definitely integrate over that. Uh, well, for the Lipschitz maps, there is a similar um, fact uh, that, that if F is only Lipschitz, then if F is uh, Lipschitz, we have a rough version of um, the Sartre theorem. Then for almost every Z, uh, from the target space, F inverse of Z is um, HM rectifiable. And that means, um, so this is, is, is a notion in geometric measure theory, but roughly it means except for a subset of HM measure zero, uh, the set, when we say a set is HM rectifiable, it means that you can um, remove a null set, HM null set from it, if then the rest of the set becomes is um, uh, a C1 uh, manifold of dimension M. So again, in this case, uh, you can integrate anyways, because you're integrating against HM measure, which will not see the bad parts of this set. So a, a typical example um, can be, for instance, so example of what these uh, pre-images look like can be uh, if you go from R2 into R1, and let's say xy maps to absolute value of x plus absolute value of y. So if you take a, a non-negative number, then the pre-images, so here's f going into r. If you take negative number, you get empty set. If you take zero, you get just the origin. But if you take any positive number, so the pre-image will look like, not will look like, will be exactly the square. So this will be uh, just the parameter, will be your pre-image. And uh, notice that um, the Sart theorem here does not apply because your map is only Lipschitz, it is not smooth. And then you cannot even find one single point where the pre-image is exactly a manifold. But this is 
from point of view of geometric measure theory, this is just as good as any manifold because, um, well, except for these corners, which have H1 measure zero, it's just a, a nice uh, one dimensional manifold. So integration also makes sense. So, um, so that's why uh, we can talk about this query of formula. Everything uh, now is well defined, this Jacobian. And then, um, yeah, probably the square isn't, isn't exactly in that shape. Maybe it's a, a diamond like, yeah, exactly. X plus Y is constant. So um, yes, you're right. And, and this integration now I just said, try to justify why it's well defined. But of course, this the theorem needs a proof. Um, so, but I won't prove that because what I'm going to talk next about is um, the metric co area for uh, you. Benham, mm -hmm. Benham, there's a question in the chat. I guess I um, did answer the one about squares. Okay, oh, go ahead. You did answer the one about squares? I did. Okay, sorry. sorry. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> How is the uh, situation going on there? No shooting so far. Okay, good to hear. So let me also um, move my chair a little bit because the sun is now rotating. Okay, so the metric query of formula says if f goes from R n plus m into x. So henceforth, unless I specify x um, will be a metric space. Um, but for this particular theorem, I need x to be h n sigma finite. So that means. Um, X is union of some of its subsets, countable union, with Hn measure of each one finite. So if I have a Lipschitz map into an Hn sigma finite metric space, then uh, exact analog of um, what we saw there. So integrating over Rn plus m, any function. Uh, again, I'm about to make a mistake. So let me, I've learned this from Hiwash. So corrections. Then um, integral of a g dLn plus m over Rn plus m equals Oh, I made the mistake again. I, I forget about the Jacobian. So I uh, got used to the version with Fubini and spherical coordinates. So um, G, so this is a, a replacement for. So there's another question in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, do you measure the HN measure on XI with respect to the intrinsic metric of X? Yes, definitely. So, so X, uh, F is not surjective or anything. So X is a metric space and this is defined on the metric space with, with no um, regard to F. So before we have F, uh, even entering the story, we have these uh, Hausdorff measures on, on HN. So uh, Hausdorff measures have a very, purely metric definitions in terms of diameters of coverings. So you don't need anything to be able to talk about Hausdorff measure on the metric space. But uh, it, then, then it is a theorem that it coincides with the measure on manifolds. But for, for the definition, it, it is always defined, even if n is not an integer. Great, great. Thanks. I, I, I really appreciate the clarifying questions. They just help me. Um, so GX, so just like before, I want to integrate G, but then there's this query, uh, uh, I mean, the Jacobian coming in, uh, we 
stop calling it the Jaco n-dimensional Jacobian, or we just call it the area factor. It's just the, the factor that makes query happen. And then um, this one, I think by now everyone can write this, uh, this one out, <laughs> except me. So x, and then I integrate pre over pre-images of um, points, uh, the function g with respect to hm measure, and then with respect to hn measure of z. So integration over a metric space, um, once you have the measure on a space, you can just talk about integrals. Of, well, why this is integrable, the, the, this inside is integrable, is part of the theorem and, and, and whatnot. So that is the co-area formula for maps that go into metric spaces. The only condition is that your metric space be sigma finite. Um, so the only unknown thing right now is what is this co-area factor and uh, what is this derivative there? So to, to talk about a Jacobian, I need to talk about derivatives and uh, what are derivatives for such maps? So what is metric derivative of f at x and what is its co-area factor? So how can we talk about derivative for maps that go into general metric spaces? Um, the first obstacle you hit is lack of any kind of linear structure on a general metric space, right? So um, from Euclidean space, the way we think about derivative is, is this linear map that pretty uh, nicely approximates your original map. But uh, with, with no linear structure on space X, you don't even have linear maps into X. There is no way you can say F of X minus F of Y or things like that. So let's talk about it. So what is the derivative of maps into metric spaces? Uh, to motivate it, let's uh, look again at the definition of a derivative for Euclidean maps. So you go from, um, so let's go again from this space into this space, although I don't need uh, these particular dimensions, but just to keep notation consistent. So f is differentiable at some x means, so it's just definition of differentiability. There exists linear map from Rn plus m into Rn such that, so f of x plus v minus f of x, notice how I use the linear structure of target, um, minus the linear map applied to V. Now this creature lives inside our N and I take its norm and then I divide it by the norm of V which lives in the domain. And uh, if this limit V goes to zero is zero. So that is what differentiability, I hope that is what differentiability means uh, for Euclidean maps. Um, there is a weaker consequence of this, which follows from a triangle inequality. And that is, if I take norms and then subtract, I get a smaller value. So I get that before subtracting the linear part, let me take norm and then linear part on its own take norm. So the new things that appeared are these guys here. Uh, so this divided by V is uh, in, even in absolute value is smaller than the previous quotient. So definitely this goes to zero as well. Now, suddenly something magical happens and uh, that is this norm here um, actually is just distance of two, the two points. So all of a sudden, I don't need the linear structure to talk about distance of two points. And then um, this one here, 
So V going to LV, this defines a semi-norm on uh, Rn plus M. So V LV semi-norm on R n plus m. It's uh, not a norm because L can be degenerate, L can be zero, for instance, uh, linear map. Uh, but, but it satisfies the triangle inequality and the scaling, uh, but, uh, but it, it's not positive definite. So uh, I subtract this norm of V, it's just uh, changing the notation. And then this one is norm of V. Uh, we have no problem in the domain because it's still Euclidean and limit of this v goes to zero is zero. Now, we see suddenly that this does make sense even for maps that map that go into metric spaces. So um, we can write the definition. Um, we say f going from Euclidean space, um, um, let's, let's say k, into metric space X is differentiable, I uh, will metrically differentiable, differentiable at X if there exists semi-norm sigma, which um, depends on X, of course, and this semi-norm is on RK such that, um, such that um, this thing is true. So here it depends on x. Okay, is this well-defined? Is it a well-defined definition? So no new questions in the chat. Um, so good, but uh, how often are maps actually differentiable? Well, the answer is um, a theorem of Kirchheim, um, which is basically the Rademacher theorem that I coded above about Lipschitz map being differentiable almost everywhere. So if f from Rn into x is Lipschitz, then um, f is metrically differentiable almost everywhere. So I hope some uh, some theorems had this exclamation at their ends. It would make them nice, but probably people would overuse it. So, so that's a great thing to know. Um, um, that's the first step in, in, in making our area formula, the, the, even the statement, to be, to be valid. So we know that at every point, um, almost every point, there is the seminar. And, and, and we call, so notation, if there is such a seminar, uh, we say this seminar is the metric derivative of f at x metric derivative of f at x. Um, so let me now define what the query of factor is. Well, I, I won't get into a uh, technical definition, just the idea, because this will have something to do with the uh, n-dimensional Jacobian in the Euclidean case as well. So let's say you are living in um, Rn plus m, and uh, you have a seminorm, so this is a seminorm on Rn plus M with rank. So rank will be the, the dimension of the linear space where it doesn't vanish. Or uh, you can talk about kernel of sigma <clears throat> and it has a dimension and you subtract from N plus M, sorry. <clears throat> So this will be some space like that. So there will be a copy of our n along which sigma does not vanish. Uh, and when restricted to this copy, <clears throat> it becomes a norm. So um, sigma 
restricted to this is a norm. Now let's forget about Rn uh, plus n. You have now one copy of Rn with this norm and you have another copy of Rn with the Euclidean norm. <clears throat> okay, and, and a norm can give a distance, right? So a distance of two points here and here, x and y, uh, their distance will be sigma of y minus x. <clears throat> and now we know it won't be zero on this x and y coincide. Um, so in building Hausdorff measures, you, you look at diameters of sets and uh, they, they are defined purely in terms of uh, the metric derivative, I, I mean, uh, the, the metric function. So you can talk about n-dimensional measure of <clears throat> uh, Rn with respect to sigma versus the usual n-dimensional measure uh, with respect to Euclidean distance, which is just the Lebesgue measure. <clears throat> So what occurs is that both are translation invariant because any norm, if you translate to a different base point, um, the distance won't, won't change. So invariant, <clears throat> so it doesn't matter if you take a X and Y here and look at their differ difference or you translate them to some other point um, by the same amount. So distance will be preserved. So these are translation invariant measures on our n, and we have this uh, me measure theoretic fact that such measures are um, basically unique up to scalar multiplication. So, exists some constant um, C such that Hn <clears throat> sigma of any set divided by Hn of A with respect to Euclidean measure is the constant C. So this tells you uh, if you switch between the two metrics, how, um, how does the area change? So um, if, if you are inside Rn and then you have this set, um, what is the ratio of the measure with respect to the Euclidean metric versus the uh, um, Lebesgue measure? And that's a constant, and that constant, uh, in this case, this constant is, is exactly what we call the n-dimensional co query factor of <clears throat> sigma. So, so that will give us the query factor of metric derivative of fx, which we needed in, in formulation of the query formula. So up here. So now I have made this statement defined. So at every point, almost every point, metric derivative exists. It's a norm. Uh, because remember our space was, target space was um, sigma finite, Hn sigma finite. The rank of metric derivative will not go above n. Uh, and uh, for those semi-norms that have rank n, we defined the query factor. I should add that if the query, if <clears throat> so, if rank sigma is strictly less than n, then we define its cn query factor to be zero. This means that uh, well, you drop one more dimension, right? You 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 um, the subspace where it is a norm is not even R n; it's R R n minus one at most. So you lose that. Um, so um, I promised that I will say that uh, this uh, query factor that I'm defining has something to do with the um, Jacobian and dimensional Jacobian in the Euclidean case. And, and this picture actually has, has that one. If you have a linear map from Rn plus M into Rn linear, and then um, it's, it's um, orthogonal complement of its kernel is, is a copy of Rn, and now restricted to that, it's a map Rn to Rn. The determinant of that map is exactly this L transpose of L 
you take determinant, you basically took twice determinant, and then you take this square root. That's why the Jacobian in the Euclidean query formula was equal to this one. It, it needs a proof. It's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful linear algebra, actually, exercise that um, it equals to that. It's, it comes from polar decomposition of maps. OK. <clears throat> Can I ask a question? Sure, go ahead. Um, in your theorem, the target space was sigma finite. So uh, hmm. is in, you, in the Euclidean setting, is Rn sigma finite? You yeah, uh, so Rn is balls, copy of balls, right? With rational um, radii and centers, right? Yeah, uh, or even integer, positive integer. So you ball of radius one, two. So this is then a, a true generalization because you don't need regularity of f at all, in the, even in the Euclidean case. Um, yeah, 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 exactly. So this contains it contains that one, exactly. Oh. So uh, f is only Lipschitz. Uh, well, I have to... Um, I have to clarify that this query formula with Lipschitz F was also known. It was proven in, in Federer's book. So oh, let me, let me actually, it's a great uh, point to stop and say, so coarea formula. Um, so in the Euclidean case, Euclidean case um, is due to Federer, um, 1960s. Well, his book appeared in 69, but he had the proof before it. And in the metric space, the, the version that I'm talking about uh, appeared in 2009 um, in a thesis of uh, Rachel and uh, also Karmanova independently proved some, some uh, under some assumptions. Um, so, so what I'm talking about is, so, so, because I'm getting closer to the end, so I have to talk about um, what contributions I have. So if you look at the, the proof of the coarea formula, the metric version, uh, the proofs are extremely technical uh, and very long. So they basically are, are um, brute force. So. GCN metric derivative of fx on dl n plus m, which remember is integral over x against n measure. And then here you have integral over pre images on g dhm. So this formula, the metric query formula, the proofs in those uh, uh, work are extremely um, technical, and, and there isn't much geometric intuition to it. So what I did was um, there was some other uh, investigations of an implicit function theorem in, for such maps, maps into metric spaces. Um, and then, so I, I prove a new version of this. So there were others available. Um, so the other one, which is actually the very important part of it, was a new coarea of inequality. So coarea inequalities um, that is, is a paper available on archive um, with Piotr Haywash. So these two results, actually, um, our motivation for both of these works was finding a simpler proof of this metric coarea formula. Uh, because um, implicit function theorem, as you will see, will, will uh, correct the fibers, the level sets, into, into beautiful geometric, simple geometric uh, configurations. And, the, and, and one would naturally ask if we could use that to prove the metric coarea formula. And the answer was yes, after uh, this work. So we, we uh, found a new implicit function theorem and, and we proved a new query inequality that together um, gave a very nice and short proof of this um, metric co area formula. So let me um, briefly, uh, say what these two are, and uh, if time allows, how they together 
give, give the um, metric query formula. So the implicit function theorem part of it, uh, which will be published in, in another paper that is coming out soon. So this is very, very recent results, maybe three weeks now. Um, so if X is again, HN sigma finite, um, F from Rn plus M into X is Lipschitz. Then the set where, so um, compare it to, to the uh, manifold version of implicit function theorem or submersion theorem rather. So let's look at X's uh, in the domain Rn plus M where rank of this metric derivative of f at x um, is at least n, okay? Then this set is a countable union of um, subsets, ki, and a null set such that, so I should have said it's a, it's a null set plus a countable union of subset ki. So for each ki, let me drop the index k. The following is true, okay? So um, this is the full space where rank is bigger than n and uh, you, you throw away a null set and then you find some measurable sets say this is your K, but it's only measurable, so it would be crazier than that. Here's F mapping into X, which is um, N dimensional. So my Ns will look like one dimensional. My N plus Ms will be like this. So what happens for each K is, the, is that there exists a map that is C1 um, from an open neighborhood of that into again Rn plus M, uh, such that the following happens. Uh, let's say you take Z here and the pre-image of Z is like this one. And you take another Z and the pre-image looks like this. And you take another one, the pre-image looks like this. Uh, what happens with this G is that now if you look at composition of F and G inverse, and you call it F, now um, the pre-images will look something like, so the pre-images will be vertical exactly. So if you take any Z, the pre-image will be just exactly the copy down here. So um, maybe this particular Z, which had a disconnected pre-image will map to this one. So, after, this means that if you change coordinates, this is a C1 change of coordinates, then your map will have this um, structure that the pre-images are exactly the fibers. In, another, in other words, it says that f of xy equals, um, so if you take a point xy, it will depend only on the x variable. And uh, this will say, call it phi. So let's say the sh shadow of this set here is some subset E of Rn. So this part is Rn. And, uh, and this phi is by Lipschitz. So the claim is that um, not just by one, but by several of such Ki's, so K25, and here is the set K. 33 and so on. So, but there is a countable union of these sets, which cover almost all of the set where rank is full. And then on each of them, after a C1 change of variables, um, your function becomes just a, a projection and then a map from Rn into, um, sorry, this is your X, right? So this space, your X. So it will be from Rn into X, which is Hn sigma finite. And you can imagine that if you have a bi-Lipschitz map from a subset of Rn into X, 
it's much easier to deal with such map. Actually, there is a, an area formula uh, for these maps. Now, the proof of the co-area formula, now you can imagine on this part will be a Fubini's theorem, right? Because the map is constant along these. So pre-image, the fiber is, is actually a, cup, a subset of our M. So the, the pre-images are not just any random sets back here, rather nice copies of our M. And uh, so it will be a Fubini theorem plus the, the theorem for, for this map, for phi. Okay, so I don't want to get into technicalities, but that uh, immediately simplifies the existing proofs for the, for the set where uh, your rank was full. So this is kind of the regular set. Okay, so that takes care of this set. <clears throat> for the other set, uh, we have this theorem, which is uh, again new, that here X is any metric space. Sorry, I will finish in, in maybe one minute. Um, F is from Rn plus M into X is Lipschitz. Then for almost every Z inside your X that you pick, uh, pre-image of Z, part of the set that is inside the set where rank is strictly, uh, so rank of metric derivative of Fx is less than n, um, then this set has hm measure zero. And this is great news because you don't have to then prove anything uh, on the set where rank is less than n. Uh, remember that the co-area factor was defined to be zero in this case, right? Rank is less than n. And on this side, you integrate stuff H and Z, remember you integrate over the part. So um, you can do this formula in two parts. First on the set where rank is bigger than N, then on the set where it is less than N, it's just an additive. Both sides are additive in the set where you consider them. Uh, so this intersection with rank less than N uh, of G. So this now has HM measure zero and your integration is against, H, is against HM measure. So this part goes to zero, and then you integrate zero over X. So you get zero equals zero. So that theorem, this theorem here, gives, uh, gives the part there. And uh, this theorem follows from the new query uh, inequality that we have uh, published recently. It follows from area and equality. Uh, this is also, a, a, the classical version is due to Feder, but this theorem wouldn't follow from that at all. So I, I think I can stop here for questions. Uh, and thanks for your attention. All right, thank you very much. Other questions, remarks, comments?